So welcome everybody um, to the session on getting started in GovCloud. Hopefully some of you were in the previous session with Karen that walked through the overview. Uh, this particular session is going to be a little bit more tactical um, to focus on once you've made the decision to move to GovCloud or if you're still figuring out if you want to use the GovCloud region, we're going to walk you through getting started in the region. My name is Keith Brooks. I run business development for the GovCloud region, so typically focused on strategy, partnerships, growth for the region, uh, work pretty much hand in hand with a lot of our customers, a lot of our SI and consulting partners, as well as some of the software vendors to onboard uh, new software offerings to the region. Also work hand in hand with Karen Arango, who did the previous session, who's a product manager. So after the session, we'll open it up for questions as well and definitely grab me or Karen and we'll uh, definitely hope to get you started using the GovCloud region. So typically, once we talk to customers or partners or potential users of the region and they've made the decision to use GovCloud, we typically get this question next, right? So I want to deploy a workload in GovCloud, um, but what do I do to get started? So as I mentioned in the opening, we're going to walk you through the, the six to seven primary steps that we typically work with customers and partners with to get up and going in the GovCloud region. So as Karen uh, walked through in the previous session, we really have three primary requirements for access to the, re to the GovCloud region. First and foremost, uh, the account holder or the person that's requesting access to GovCloud has to be a U.S. person. And by U.S. person, we mean U.S. citizen or a green card holder. Second major requirement is the entity, corporation, or organization that that person works for has to be a U.S. entity, right? So you have to be a, uh, a U.S. entity on U.S. soil before you can be granted access to the GovCloud region. Um, in certain cases where it's a technology vendor or perhaps a consulting company that may be owned by a foreign entity, the person has to be working for the organization that's the independent subsidiary that's based in the U.S. You have to meet those two fundamental U.S.-based requirements before you can be granted access to the region. And then as Karen mentioned earlier as well, you have to not be barred from handling export controlled data. Even if you do not use uh, GovCloud for ITAR workloads, you still cannot be banned from handling export controlled data, right? So for first and foremost, from a requirements for access perspective, it's US person working for a US entity that can handle export controlled data. Once you've made the determination that you meet those three requirements, we then can move forward with getting you onboarded to the region. And there are six key pieces of information that we require um, to start the process to onboard. We're going to need the full legal name of the entity that the account holder or the person that's requesting access works for. We need the account holder's full name. We need email address, phone number, the address for the organization that that person's affiliated with and the AWS account number. So we're gonna spend some time in the future slide talking about the relationship between the GovCloud region and a standard AWS account, but in order to be granted access to the region, you have to have a standard Amazon Web Services account first. We will ask for the account number for that standard number as part of the onboarding process to the region. Um, and as always, if you do not have an account, AWS accounts are free, you can sign up at aws.amazon.com. If you do not have an account, do that first and then get us the information and we can get the, the process going for you to get onboarded to the region. So where do you send the information? If you work for an organization or a company that has an account manager on, in AWS, you send that six key pieces of information to your account manager. The account manager will then start the onboarding process on your behalf. So send them an email uh, or give them a phone call send the information to them and they will uh, start the onboarding process on your behalf. If you work for an organization that, that does not have a dedicated AWS account manager, you can send the information directly to the GovCloud team. Um, just send us a note using the contact us form on our website, uh, aws.amazon.com forward slash govcloud dash us forward slash contact. Um, that email will come to me and Karen and a few other folks on our team send us the information that was required or, or stated in the previous slide, and we can start the onboarding process to the GovCloud region on your behalf. So 
once we get the information uh, from interested parties, we then start the actual process of getting you onboarded to the region. Uh, one of the first primary steps that you're going to have to do is sign the GovCloud uh, amendment. And the GovCloud amendment amends the standard click-through agreement that you're going to sign when you sign up for a standard AWS account. But the amendment focuses on the specific terms and conditions that come with access to the GovCloud region. So you'll get the, the amendment. It's going to come to you via email as a DocuSign document. Read through the document, sign it, and send it back to us, and then we'll move the process along to get you access. The important things to note about the amendment is it covers kind of three primary areas that you're going to have to acknowledge before you can get access to the GovCloud region. First and foremost, we talk about security. So as Karen mentioned uh, in the previous session, from an internal standpoint, we use U.S. persons to operate and manage the region from an AWS perspective. We lay all out of that out in the uh, GovCloud amendment. The amendment also talks about restricted access um, to the region from the standpoint of the customer, right? So you, if, especially if you're processing sensitive workloads that are ITAR related, you're gonna have to also attest that you're gonna only have US persons accessing that data in the region if you deploy workloads that fit that criteria. It also gives recommendations on setting up compliance programs so that if you're a consulting firm or a SI vendor and you're developing workloads on behalf of your government customers, it recommends that you have the proper compliance programs in place from your perspective to ensure that you remain in compliance with your end customer's requirements for operating sensitive workloads in the region. Um, it also talks about additional user responsibilities, I'm sorry, uh, additional user responsibilities around security, best practices, and things of that nature. So as you get to this point in, in, in the onboarding process, um, you definitely have to sign that amendment um, and get that back to us. And then once we get the amendment that's signed from you, we'll move the process on to the next, to the next phase. So we do a few things on our end once we get the amendment back. Um, one of the things we will do immediately is we'll take the information that was submitted, um, both the account holder information and the information for the entity that the account holder works through, uh, works for, and we will vet them um, to ensure that you are not barred from export control data. So we will do research and run searches on our end to check against the Department of State databases to ensure that the account holder or the organization is not barred from access uh, to export control data. We will then set up a time with you. We'll, actually, before we do that, we'll create the account, we'll create your credentials, and you will receive an email from the uh, GovCloud operations team that will send to you your account information in an encrypted PDF file. We will then set up a time via the email uh, to call you to deliver the password to open that encrypted PDF document. We will not send you the password to your PDF file in the email. So once the GovCloud operations team uh, sets up a time to talk to the account holder, we'll, we'll give you a call, we'll walk through kind of the terms and conditions, and we will deliver you the password to open your PDF file. Once you open the PDF, you're going to verify your account credentials. That's going to include your GovCloud account ID and all the information required to get you going in GovCloud. Once you verify those, uh, those account credentials, uh, we're then going to get you set up to use the GovCloud onboard tool, which will then walk you step by step through getting the final stages of the onboard process completed. And then within the next few steps, you're going to actually then have access to the GovCloud region. So when you download the onboard tool itself, um, we're going to provide you with a document or a link to a document called Accessing the AWS Management Console for GovCloud. It details the instructions and the steps required to set up the GovCloud console. You'll see in a future slide why we have this process, but as Karen mentioned in the previous session, GovCloud is physically and logically isolated. It has a, a completely separate I am database, a separate authentication stack, and it also has its own independent console. So for those of you that are familiar with AWS or have used AWS in, in the past, you will know that we have a management console that gives you access to the services and the features of the region. Well, in the standard AWS console, you will notice that there's a region selector in the top right-hand corner. You will not see GovCloud in that region selector for the simple fact that we have a completely isolated console for interacting with GovCloud resources. 
when you download the onboard tool and you walk through these, in these instructions, it will actually set up the GovCloud console for your account, right? So you're gonna run the onboard tool. Um, it's gonna walk you through a few steps. You're gonna create an IAM administrator role uh, for your account. It's also gonna allow you to create an account alias for your GovCloud account, which is just another way to refer to your account when you wanna log into it. Um, it will walk you through rotating your keys and then once you rotate your keys, you can then um, kind of best practice is to log into the console using that IAM administrator role that you just created. And now you're free to do some damage in GovCloud once you get through this step. So this is just a snapshot of the console itself. Um, just to reiterate that it, it, it looks like the same console that our standard AWS accounts have. You will notice that you know, it just lists the services by category and you, know, you interact with the console the same way you do for the standard console. But just like you cannot see uh, GovCloud, the GovCloud region in the standard console, you will not see any other region from the GovCloud console, right? So if you have workloads that are in US East or US West or Frankfurt or Sao Paulo, you will not be able to interact with those regions and deploy resources in those regions for this console for obvious reasons. One thing to point out about the console is you'll notice in the top right-hand corner, there is a link to the uh, AWS GovCloud user guide. Hopefully by this point, uh, you've already read that guide to a certain extent, but we do include a link to the user guide directly from the console because the user guide is basically like the Bible for, for using the GovCloud region. It talks about the features of the region, it talks about the security elements of the region, it talks about the ITAR boundary, it describes the services that are in the region, and within those services, what's considered within the ITAR boundary and what's not. So we provide a handy link directly to that user guide from the console. But you know, once you get your console set up, this is what you're gonna see, and you're, you're, you're free to start interacting with your resources and deploying workloads in GovCloud. So as a best practice, we typically recommend that before you do anything around deploying workloads, you, you take time to set up your identity and access management, user accounts, roles, and groups, because this is the primary service that you're gonna to use to control user and application access to your data and your resources in your GovCloud region. So best practice is to set up IAM groups, users, and roles before you start deploying any workloads or doing anything else in the GovCloud region. Um, as we mentioned, as you walk through the onboard tool, it will help you, it will actually create a default admin role for you. At this point, you're likely logged in via that admin role, but at this point of the process, it's typically best practice for you to create a few additional roles and a few additional groups um, beyond that admin role and then use those roles for your development teams or your admin teams or any other users that need access to the resources in GovCloud to access the console itself. After configuring your IAM user groups and roles, um, what you're then, gonna gonna you're, you're then gonna focus on is the configuring your virtual private cloud. And as Karen mentioned in the previous session, VPC is our service that allows isolation of services and data and workloads in the GovCloud region. And it allows you to basically extend, if you're, v if you're establishing a connection from your on-prem environment in the GovCloud, it allows you to set that network environment, that virtual network up in the GovCloud region, isolate your resources, and control IP address space and things of that nature uh, for your GovCloud instance. You're gonna have the ability to configure subnets, which allow you to control literally the IP address range um, for your virtual network in the GovCloud region private subnets, which don't have access to the internet, public subnets, which will access the internet. Um, you're gonna be able to set up routing tables to control how your network traffic's gonna be routed within your VPC and GovCloud. You're gonna set up internet gateways, which allow you to, to connect to the internet, uh, as well as virtual private gateways, which are the mechanism for which you're gonna VPN to connect your on-prem environments or your colo environments to your GovCloud resources. So once you set up the IAM roles, uh, the next step that we recommend is to focus on configuring your VPC. And then once you get that set up, you're now in a better position to start deploying workloads in, in the GovCloud region. And you know, for, for customers or users that aren't familiar with best practices around VPCs, 
we do have reference architectures and other documents available to help guide you through certain patterns or anti-patterns uh, for setting up your VPC environment in GovCloud. So you have your IAM user set up, you have groups set up, you have roles, and your VPC is configured. You're now really able to do damage in GovCloud, right? So, so once you get this set up, you're able to take advantage of all the services and the features that are offered in the region to deploy your workloads. So as Karen mentioned, we, we, we started with the basic services back in 2011, things like EC2, S3, IAM, VPC. Um, but as she showed in the evolution, um, uh, uh, the history of innovation for GovCloud, you now have a pretty rich set of services to build your workloads in the GovCloud region. Um, you can take advantage of things like Glacier, um, DynamoDB. We have additional services that are a little bit more advanced like uh, our relational database service, which is the fully managed um, database. We have Elasticast, which is your in-memory database. We have Elastic Map Reduce, which is our hosted Hadoop framework. We have Amazon Redshift, which is the fully managed data warehouse service. So once you actually get your environment configured, you can then start to deploy resources leveraging the services that are available in the GovCloud region. Uh, and note, just kind of disclaimer, there are more services than this in the region. This is just for uh, uh, representation's sake. So, one thing we want to take a minute to, to, to kind of hit upon here is the relationship between a standard AWS account and the GovCloud account. So as I mentioned in the beginning when we talked about the onboarding process, you have to have an existing AWS account before we can grant you access to the region. Um, you will hear some people refer to it as a GovCloud account. In reality, what we're doing is simply allowing your standard AWS account to access the GovCloud region. You will get a unique number that's typically referred to as your GovCloud account number, um, but it's important to note that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the GovCloud account and the standard AWS account that you use to onboard to the region, right? And because of that, we, we, we have to make sure that, you know, some customers understand that because GovCloud is isolated, to reiterate, you, you won't see GovCloud from the standard console, right? So, you know, best practice is just to remember that there is a one-to-one -one relationship here, and the relationship is really driven by the fact that your, stater, your standard AWS account is simply granted access to the, to the GovCloud region. Now, where that becomes important is because there are a few things that you're still going to have to do in the standard account that's linked to your GovCloud account. One of the reasons you're gonna to have to still use that standard account, regardless of if you actually deploy workloads or resources in that standard account, is from a billing perspective. Your GovCloud uh, charges will roll up to your standard AWS account. So when you log into that standard account and view the bill, the way the bills are broken down, it shows uh, resource consumption and charges per service per region. GovCloud is just another region, so it shows up on that same bill as the GovCloud region. So if you're deploying workloads or services in other regions, you'll see charges for US East, you'll see charges for US West. If you're deploying workloads in some of our uh, uh, regions overseas, you'll see those regions listed. And then you will also see GovCloud listed on that same bill. So the one bill gives you all of your charges throughout all of your services across all of the regions, and GovCloud shows up on that bill uh, for your standard account as well. Now, we do have some customers that take advantage of a concept that we have called consolidated billing. So consolidated billing allows you to roll up multiple charges, uh, multiple invoices across multiple accounts into a single invoice. That still applies with GovCloud, right? So you could have you know, one to n many GovCloud accounts, each still having a one-to-one -one relationship with the standard AWS account, but you can still take advantage of consolidated billing and roll all of your GovCloud charges up via that consolidated invoice. So you will see per account, per region, per service, the charges listed across all of your accounts on a single consolidated bill. Um, so you still get the, uh, the ability to take advantage of that type of feature um, in the AWS GovCloud region as well. So from a support perspective, we, we have a service called AWS Support Center. And Support Center is basically the central way to submit support case help tickets, to view the status of tickets, to view additional resources all around using the AWS platform. 
Now, this, the, the support center is another capability that you have to interact with via your standard account. So if you need to submit a help uh, uh, support ticket for your GovCloud region, your GovCloud account, you're gonna have to do that through your standard account as well. So when you log into the console, your standard AWS console, you will see a link at the top right for support center. You click the link, you go in and you submit your case. Um, the only thing that we ask is when you submit that case, you notify that it's for your GovCloud account. You include that account number so that the support folks that receive the ticket realize that it's not for your standard account, but the ticket is actually associated with your corresponding GovCloud account. Um, but again, just to reiterate, that you, you cannot access Support Center from the GovCloud region. So this is another one of those features that you're going to have to log into the standard account uh, to take advantage of. In addition to Support Center, one of the, the pretty cool services we do have in the GovCloud region is Trusted Advisor. So for those of you who are not familiar with Trusted Advisor, it's basically a pretty nifty service that almost works as a virtual consultant. All right, for your, for your GovCloud environment. It's also in the other regions as well. But it allows you to, it'll, it'll look at your resources, it'll look at how you've architected your workloads, and it'll make recommendations for uh, cost efficiency, um, to improve reliability, it'll, it'll help highlight performance issues you may have, and it'll give you a set of recommendations to take advantage of that. Trusted Advisor is one of the newer services we have, but it is also in the GovCloud region. So, if you're not quite ready for a full-blown support case via the support center, uh, you can definitely take advantage of Trusted Advisor as well just to uncover additional efficiencies and best practices um, that you can actually highlight in your GovCloud region um, in an automated fashion, and you can take action on those recommendations directly from your account. Now, one of the, the best practices we, we, we typically advise customers on is before purchasing reserve instances, which um, are longer term commitments that allow you to take advantage of certain cost savings for EC2 compute services, you want to use Trusted Advisor to fine tune your environments before purchasing RIs, right? So typically, right, you can look at Trusted Advisor and use it on an ongoing fashion, but before you deploy your production workloads, definitely take advantage of Trust Advisor in the GovCloud region before making the longer term commitments to things like reserve instances. So just in closing, uh, a few important things to remember with, with the GovCloud region. Karen hit on a few of these topics in the previous session, but just to reiterate. So GovCloud is physically and logically isolated from any of our other regions in the AWS platform. That means it has separate availability zones. As we mentioned, it has a separate management console a completely independent IAM authentication stack, um, separate credentials, the whole nine yards. So it, it, it literally is an isolated region within our platform. And as Karen mentioned, it's not just for US government. So we have quite a diverse mix of, of, of users of the GovCloud region. We have federal, state, and local governments, um, but we do have defense contractors, system integrators, consulting firms. We have software vendors. We have education institutes, nonprofits. Um, they run the gamut, but it's basically, you know, if you meet the requirements for access and if you're not barred from handling export control data, if you have requirements that really necessitate those regulated and sensitive workloads, um, as Karen mentioned, all levels of control on classified information, or if you have certain compliance requirements that you have to meet, things like DOD CSM 3 through 5, or if you have ITAR requirements, or as Karen mentioned with CGIS, um, you can definitely access the GovCloud region as long as you, you meet those requirements. And then in closing, just to kind of you know, reiterate the shared responsibility model that Karen walked through. So as she mentioned, we're responsible for the hypervisor down. So that, in that includes everything through physical location of our data centers, um, the hypervisor software, the host OS and things of that nature. And even in GovCloud, you still have your responsibilities above that stack, right? So everything from the application layer um, up is the responsibility uh, of the user. Again, when you see the GovCloud amendment, we, we, we touch upon some of those responsibilities in the amendment so that we're very upfront when you sign the amendment that these are your responsibilities. Um, of course, it gets a little bit more sensitive in the GovCloud region given the nature of the, the features of the region. But even in GovCloud, even though it has more compliance features than, than our other regions, the shared responsibility model still applies. So definitely um, um, keep that in mind when accessing the region. So with that, we'll open it up for questions.
Any questions? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> We're looking to uh, put together a, um, a new ERP software um, platform, and we're leaning toward putting it in the cloud as opposed to hosting it locally. Would this be something that would be recommended? And then the other thing with the users and, uh, and the, the stricter accessibility, because the ERP software, there would be various levels of, of access from the lowest user trying to get a, uh, uh, you know, a procurement uh, requisition in to the highest user you know, doing financial data and, and stuff like that. What Would you recommend that? Do you know of anybody that's doing that now? And we're specifically looking at Microsoft Dynamics. Okay. Um, can you repeat the first part of your question? I'm sorry, the mic was going in and out. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, the first part? Just basically that we're looking to run an ERP uh, mm -hmm. uh, application in this, Microsoft Dynamics, and we wanted to find out, is there any disadvantages, advantages to do it in the cloud? I mean, obviously security reasons, mm -hmm. but is there anything that, you know, are you familiar with any uh, any government entities running that in, in the government cloud right now? Yeah, so so we have, uh, as Karen mentioned, since 2011, we've, we've had quite the growth of, of users of the GovCloud region. Um, we have customers across federal government, uh, state and local, that are using GovCloud for all types of workloads, right? So. Um, we work with our software vendors that make ERP solutions and CRM solutions um, that have deployed in GovCloud. Um, it really boils down to the use case, right? So it, it's, it's nothing unique about GovCloud that would, would not make it a candidate deploy in, in the region. We, we, we see quite a few, um, we see quite a diverse mix of workloads that end up in the region, right? So it is really just gonna boil down to if you have you know, requirements that align to some of the features of GovCloud. Obviously, GovCloud makes sense. If not, you know, you can deploy in other regions. But we do have customers that will deploy in GovCloud even though they don't have those requirements, right? So because there's a level of vetting that we go through to ensure that we know who's coming into the region, um, a lot of customers just like the community cloud nature of it, right? So because of that, you know, we, we typically end up with, with quite a diverse mix of, of organizations in it. But it definitely, that's definitely feasible for, for GovCloud. Um, it's definitely feasible for cloud. I think, you know, as, soon as, as long as you embrace the shared responsibility model and from a security perspective, take care of the things that you're going to have to from the application layer, there's no reason that you can't deploy in GovCloud. Any other questions? Yes, yeah, sir. So, uh, how do we take care? Who will take care of the uh, uh, issue like performance and uh, growing, you know, in our environment, dynamic growth? Uh, yeah. So the question is, how did, who takes care of the dynamic growth in their environment? So the scaling, how do they handle scale? Right, so we have features that give you the ability to take advantage of things like scaling, right? So. Um, Elastic load balancer and auto scaling are features that are available in the region. So as long, as long as you architect and design your workloads and applications the right way, a lot of that is automated, right? So GovCloud, again, GovCloud operates just like all of our other regions, right? So there's nothing unique that prevents you from scaling out as needed in the GovCloud region. So definitely take advantage of, of things like auto scaling. And as you need that capacity, as your workloads grow, your workloads will grow in the GovCloud region just like they do in any other region in our platform. So we take, there's an element that we take care of on our end, but it's still the customer's responsibility to design their applications to take advantage of those features, right? So we give you the tools to scale as needed. You just have to architect to take advantage of those features. Hi, are the Hi. various agencies like CMS or NIH uh, showing any preference for GovCloud over regular cloud? Hmm. And are there any pricing differences or right. availability differences? So, so we can't speak to specific clients and customers um, due to non-disclosure right, agreements. Um, I will say that we, we have a lot of customers in that space, both government agencies and nonprofits, you know, similar organizations, that run workloads in both. Right, so uh, it came up in the previous session where uh, in, there isn't quite one-for-one -one service parity between GovCloud and like US East. So if a certain customer organization wants to take advantage of a service that's not in GovCloud, and if they don't have requirements that necessitate some of the features, they will deploy in US East or US West. Um, however, right, what we, what we tend to find is the services that are in GovCloud span a pretty broad gamut of, of, of features and, and functionality. 
So it really just boils down to the requirements, right? We, 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 we typically see organizations deploying in both. Of course, we have some organizations that only deploy in GovCloud, especially government agencies, right? They like the features, they like the government, uh, excuse me, the community cloud nature of it. And even if, like, say for instance, they don't, they're not in DOD, right? So they don't have to adhere to three through five requirements from a cloud security model. They like that compliance regime, and although they don't have that requirement, they want to take advantage of the feature. And that's one of the good things about the platform, right? So as we innovate and deploy new features and services, even if it's for a specific client, we push that out to all the users of the platform, right? So you, you immediately get to take advantage of those features yourself, whether you're a government agency or a software vendor or a consulting firm or a private organization that just likes those features, right? So I would say they're still using both. Um, and across that, we, we still see customers also using hybrid architectures, right? So even if they're not going all in to GovCloud, right, they're extending their, their IT environment out and leveraging some of the features we have to extend their, uh, their workloads and their applications. Oh, sorry. Yeah, pricing differences. So there is about a 20 to 30 percent difference in price between GovCloud and US East, right? US East is our biggest region, so it's also the region that typically has the lowest prices. Um, but given some of the unique uh, features of GovCloud and some of the requirements that we have to meet on our end, um, it, it, there is about a 20 to 30 percent uh, increase over the US East as a baseline. That, that's kind of a, you know, thumb of reference. Um, and like I said, it's mostly due to what we have to do internally to offer that capability at that scale and still meet all the, re the compliance requirements on our end. And, and oh. by the way, just to follow up on that question, so if you go to our website, actually let me put up the link here, um, there is actually, you know, we publish all of our prices, it's all public knowledge. So if you actually go to the aws.amazon.com forward slash govcloud dash US, there is actually a link uh, to the services that are in the region and you can see the prices there as well. Um, and if you take advantage of like our uh, TCO calculator, total cost of ownership calculator, you can actually select GovCloud in that as well so that as you're modeling out what your workloads uh, would potentially cost to run on AWS, you can actually model it out uh, for GovCloud as well, and that'll give you the specific charges and estimate based on the variables you put in for, for GovCloud as well. Keith, one of the things that you uh, just mentioned was that there are some differences between US East and, and GovCloud. One of the things that um, we're interested in uh, is understanding updates to instance, the, the gold copies of the instances um, when uh, updates and patches come out um, you know, to, to the OSs and things. Are there uh, differences in the release cycle between East and, and, the, and the GovCloud um, I, I, as far as how quickly patches and things like that would go into, right. into a gold copy? So, so from a patching perspective, there's no difference, right? So we deploy those things out immediately um, as soon as we're aware of them. So as we push them to East, West, GovCloud will get them as well. Um, from a service rollout perspective, you're actually sitting next to the person that you'll get the emails for, from. Um, so Karen uh, you know, does a real good job of any new services or new features that are deploying. Um, she sends those emails out after she's coordinated with the service teams deploying GovCloud. Um, so from a, from a service deployment perspective, um, sometimes there is a lag between East getting a service and GovCloud getting a service just because we typically roll things out to US East first. Uh, but from a patching perspective, anything that's security related, we definitely deploy those out uh, immediately. There's no difference uh, from that perspective. And a follow on question, and it's related to cl uh, CloudTrail and the separation between the GovCloud uh, and East or the other regions. Are there architectures that you've seen with some of your federal customers where they have uh, a consolidated CloudTrail view of all of their uh, environments so that they can do the, uh, um, the, the, the monitoring across really everything that they've got? I mean, from, both from a security a a as well as just a, an optimization perspective, I, I got to imagine that that's. It's something that we're looking at and trying to figure out how we, we work through that. But any any comments? Yeah. So do you want to? You're yeah, nodding, Karen. Sure. Like so here. yeah. I mean, it depends. If you're processing ITAR data, right? Then you're going to want to make sure that you bring in any of your cloud trail logs into the region from other regions. So you can consolidate where you want, and then you can use Splunk or you know some other tool to bring them all together. So bring to. But, uh, bring into, right? Okay. Now, right. if you're not processing ITAR data or you're not, you, your data can travel outside the region, 
then you're fine. You know, right. so that's your responsibility. But you can combine your logs from every region and then use a right. Splunk or some tool to analyze them. Yeah, the thing to keep in mind with GovCloud is if you're if, if you are processing like ITAR data, you just have to be very cognizant of what you're sending outside of the region, um, just to avoid a data violation, right, on, on your end, right. But as Karen mentioned, if if you're not processing ITAR. You can definitely move it out, yeah. but as a best practice, we, we typically see customers bring those logs into the region to do their analysis there. And just to just to um, reiterate what you said about the um, user guide, so in the user guide that you can get to from the docs page on AWS, or you can get to it from the console um, in GovCloud, every service has a defined ITAR boundary. So that tells you where you can store your ITAR data or sensitive data and only U.S. persons within AWS would see it um, and what, what those, where those boundaries are for that service. So it gives you a guidance, like certain services um, may not allow any ITAR data and so that data can travel in and out of the region and you can feel safe about that. Yeah. Any other questions? I didn't hear any mention of Direct Connect. Is that available as well as the VPN service? To get, you know, because that's available in other regions. Yep. Yeah. So Direct Connect is available. Um, so the way it works today is you will Direct Connect uh, through like one of the US East colos, and then you essentially rod the AWS backbone all the way up to 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 GovCloud, right? So at this time, that's the option for for Direct Connect into uh, the GovCloud region. Yeah, but it's definitely available. We have customers taking advantage of it today. Yeah, every every colo facility in the United States, yeah. you can connect a Direct Connect to, and if you use US East or West or any other region and use Direct Connect into there, and then you would ride the backbone, AWS backbone, with inter-region charges right. to the GovCloud region. Yep. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, well, All right. so, uh, our contact information is there. I think, I think we're going to post these slides on SlideShare afterwards. So you know, if you have any additional questions on GovCloud, any additional questions on getting started, definitely don't hesitate to either send me an email or Karen an email, and we'll definitely uh, get your questions answered. OK? Thanks, guys.